Vu Melang, welcome to Face the Nation. My name is Clement Magnatella. It's great to have you with us here on SABC News as we launch this brand new show that will bring decision makers, business leaders, and newsmakers to face you, the nation. We'll be live on this channel on Tuesdays and Thursdays at 8 p.m. On the show tonight, we're discussing the Gauteng High Court's decision to strike from the role the National Assembly Speaker Nosivu Mapisa Ngakula's urgent bid to block her arrest for corruption. Judge Sulet Potterell agreed with the state that it would not be competent for her to interdict the arrest. Now, this ruling effectively paves the way for the investigative directorate to formally charge her. So, will she be handing herself over to the police? When will she be charged? We have her lawyer, Stephen May, joining us this evening. And then later, now that the Speaker of Parliament will be charged in court, what approach is the ANC going to take? Does she appear before the ANC's Integrity Commission? When does that step aside resolution kick in? And if the motion of no confidence in her is debated in Parliament, how does the ANC vote? We'll be joined by the ANC's Veterans League President, Snooki Zikalala. Snooki Zikalala and Stephen May are facing the nation tonight. But first, my views. Now, this Gauteng High Court ruling is quite significant for a number of reasons. In my view, it effectively emphasizes the principle of equality before the law. It doesn't matter whether you're a president, a speaker, a minister, a business leader, a celebrity or an ordinary citizen. We are all equal before the law. So if the NPA is convinced that they have a strong case against you and they believe beyond reasonable doubt that they are prospects of a successful prosecution, then they must act, regardless of who is the suspect. We cannot have a situation where people want to be treated differently by law enforcement because they hold certain public positions. And I think in this case, that was the attempt. But Judge Sulet Potterell made it very clear today that interdicting the speaker's arrest would lead to the collapse of the criminal justice system. Here's what she said. It is quite disturbing that some people would view legal issues from an uninformed emotional and political perspective. This is purely a legal matter. This is purely a decision that is taken with the NPA guided by evidence and what was before them, hence the decision to prosecute. More importantly, um, a court has to take cognizance of the fact that if the court grants such an order, the floodgates will be open. Every suspect will be in a position to approach a court on an urgent basis, setting out on speculation that there is a weak case against it and interdict an arrest. And she's right. The criminal justice system would be controlled by suspects, wouldn't it? When the NPA wants to arrest someone, what would stop them from approaching the courts to interdict the arrest on the basis that, well, I have a doctor's appointment, or I have an exam, or that, oh, it's my birthday, you can't arrest me. I mean, the NPA, yes, is obliged to effect an arrest when the case is ready, but they can't continue with an arrest when there's a court interdict application. So people would end up abusing court processes because they have access to lawyers, they've got access to resources. And in this case, the Speaker of Parliament did achieve what she wanted. She was buying time with this attempt in court to interdict her arrest, and she got it. It's a classic Stalingrad approach that we have seen in the past by some political leaders. But this judgment is significant because it stops such attempts in the future. And as we've heard from the NPA spokesperson Mtunzi Maga, after the judgment, this is not a political matter. And that's exactly what happens most times, right? After mostly political leaders are charged or are about to be charged, they claim their cases are political. They claim that they're ready to appear in court to clear their names, but when it's time to go to court, like in this case, they want to stop that process. Now, Nosifuya Mapisa Ngakula will likely appear in court soon. Once she is officially charged, the ANC's step aside resolution kicks in. What do you expect her to do? Should she resign as the Speaker of Parliament and understand that this is bringing Parliament into disrepute? Or do you think that she should stick around? Because sometimes these cases take forever. And sometimes they are struck off the roll for lack of evidence. And people have suffered reputational damage. 
The reality here is the speaker is facing serious corruption allegations. She's accused of soliciting and receiving more than 2.3 million rand in bribes from a defense contractor during her tenure as the defense minister. The person who allegedly paid these millions to her has given the details of how and when these monies were paid. So to continue as if nothing happened, I don't think is an option. I think she must do the right thing. She must consider the credibility of the institution she leads, the country's legislative authority. She must also take into account the implications that this has for her own party and its renewal agenda. But if history is anything to go by, all this might not happen. She may not resign and the ANC may close ranks like they have done in the past and defend her if the motion of no confidence in her continues. That will not be the first time that the party does that. Where it uses its majority to close ranks. But also, I think we need to keep a close eye on the NPA. They've previously taken more than what they can chew, losing some high profile cases after confidently declaring the strength of those cases. So the question I'm asking again this evening is, do you believe that the NPA has the capacity to successfully prosecute this case? And should she resign as the Speaker of Parliament and understand that this is bringing Parliament into disrepute? Or do you think she should stick around because sometimes these cases take forever and sometimes they're struck off the roll for lack of evidence? And that happens after people have suffered reputational damage. You can give us your views. You've heard mine. What are yours? Please send us a WhatsApp voice note right now on 078-459-1897. Remember to tell us your name, uh, your surname, and where you are sending that voice note from. Or you can tweet us at FaceTheNationSABC. After the break, we want to speak to Mapisa Ngakula's lawyer, Stephen May. Stay with us. Welcome to Face the Nation. Now, National Assembly Speaker Nosevi and Mapisa Ngakula's legal team have lost their application to halt the state from effecting their client's arrest. Her attorney, Stephen May, had raised some concerns about the timing and strength of the state's case. However, the matter was struck off the roll with Judge Sulet Potrel agreeing with the state that it would not be competent of her to interdict it from arresting Mapisa Ngakula. Does this now pave the way for the investigating directorate to formally charge the speaker? Well, the attorney representing Nosivu and Mapisa Ngakula, Stephen May, joins us now um, on Face the Nation. Stephen, thank you so much for uh, making time for us this evening. Now that you have lost your application to interdict the speaker's arrest, when will she be handing herself over and appearing in court? Well, Clement, uh, um, that's a loaded question. Um, I wouldn't like to answer it at this point in time but i can what i can tell you is that uh, we're in our final consultation it's always been our position that we're not uh running away from justice we did seek accommodation from the investigating directorate and the npa um for me to be back in johannesburg uh so so you know all i can really say is that we're in our final consultations um and engagement with the the investigating directorate all right, just, just please help us understand, Stephen, what's there to consult about? Um, it, my understanding is that as the lawyer representing the speaker, you had indicated that you would be actually be in a position to go with her as she hands herself over by the 3rd um, of April. Now that the court has ruled that, in fact, you can't interdict the arrest, I mean, I would imagine that says she has to now hand herself over. So when you talk about consultations, are you suggesting there are consultations on when that is going to happen or on whether or not that should happen? Well, look, I don't want to go into specifics, but uh, obviously on a, as a very general proposition, any time that you hand yourself over for arrest, bail immediately becomes an issue. And so we need to finalize our uh, arrangements insofar as that's concerned. Uh, this is a Schedule 5 matter of the Criminal Procedure Act. And so, uh, you, you know, we, we will bear the onus at bail and we will have to satisfy the court that we should be released on bail. And so, um, you know, those, those are the types of things that we now need to, to urgently uh, put in place. Um, you know, in, in, pen, pending what, 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 what is next to happen. What do you think you still need to iron out? The, the state has already indicated that they don't want to um, oppose bail. That's not their plan. They're saying 
all she needs to do is to come through, hand herself over, and then they will go through to the court. She appears, um, and then she can be on bail. No, Clement, um, it's not quite as simple as that. You, of, of course, that we've been given an undertaking, an undertaking that the NPA is not going to oppose bail, but that doesn't mean that we don't carry the onus. Uh, Schedule 5 and Schedule 6 of the Criminal Procedure Act uh, or, or, or serious charges uh, dictate that when a person is arrested on these charges, they carry the onus and they must satisfy the court. So even if the NPA does nothing, we are still required to uh, satisfy the court that, sec that, that, that Section 60 or well, the requirements of Section 60 sub 4 of the Criminal Procedure Act are met, and that we can, uh, the, the court is safe in releasing us from bail, on bail. Now, obviously, I'm, I'm, I'm confident in that regard. I don't see any problems, but that's not, a, uh, that's not an excuse to be cavalier about it. One needs to be cautious and prudent. Let me ask a, a, a question about where the speaker is now. When you talk about consultations you still need to have, is it safe to say the speaker does understand that there's now no other option but for her to hand herself over and to appear in court? Does she understand that? Gosh, Clement, um, you're asking me very loaded questions. I'm not comfortable answering that. Look, oh, the, the, the ruling has been all made. I, all I'll do, I Clement, is... is, yeah. is is, is repeat what I said before. It's never been our position that we are uh, trying to, to disengage or not uh, grapple with the charges that we need to grapple with. Um, it's, 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 it's a question that my client has got certain constitutional rights, as everybody has, um, and, and she's entitled to stand on and assert those rights. And so, you know, that, that is all we've done. We've, we've gone to court with bona fide to, to assert certain rights. But we've never been of the position or of the view that, um, you, you know, when, when allegations are leveled, they should not be, um, uh, we, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't grapple with them. Quite the contrary, what we sought is disclosure um, of exactly what the basis of these are and, and what the state's evidence is. Because um, what has come out in the media, in my view, and my, my view has, was, was before and is still, that... The, the sort of selective disclosure that has happened via leaks from the NPA could only have emanated from the NPA, um, discloses a very weak, uh, contrived case. Um, of course, of course, uh, Madam Justice Potrell's judgment has an effect on what our on, on, on how we do things and how we we, we, we now need to view it. Yeah. But uh, that doesn't mean that our view of the case changes, and it certainly doesn't mean that um, at the time or before this application that we were not prepared to grapple with the charges, and it doesn't mean that uh, we're not now, we certainly are. Yeah. And, and we'll, we'll, we'll get into the merits of the case, uh, particularly this uh, urgent application to interdict uh, the arrest in a moment. But just forgive me here, Stephen, I'm just trying to make sure that the viewers understand clearly what the viewers what the speaker's position is tonight so i'm sorry if i sound like i'm repeating myself is it fair to say the speaker is not opposed to handing herself over and appearing in court now that the judgment has been made is it fair to make that characterization look you know the course of this case is uh, there, there have been some twists and turns as the selective disclosure has leaked out there, ha uh, there, has, there has been a view that, that strengthened view that the case is really falls below the threshold which one is required to answer. Uh, if, the, the proposition in law is that if there isn't a sufficient case to, to that, that, that you actually ought to be uh, put to answering it, um, in other words, that the, the evidence is just too weak. Um, that you shouldn't be required to say anything or, 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 or put on the back foot, so to mm -hmm. speak. Um, that is still our view. Um, that said, it's never been our view that we wouldn't hand ourselves over, or, you know, when the time came to do that. Now, whether that's now or whatever the case is, I'm not prepared and I, I'm not instructed to, to say now. But, um, you, you know, 
the, the media was well aware of certain correspondence that I sent to the NPA right at the outset. I think the very first letter that I sent that was quite clear, you know, give us a reasonable accommodation, given that I'm, I'm away and engaged in another matter. Um, this is not asking for anything new uh, uh, or, or really novel or, or different from what the average person is entitled to. Um, you're entitled to chosen legal representation and you're entitled to some sort of reasonable accommodation. Um, you know, I know mention has been made of a Stalingrad technique. You know, all I would say to that, or, or Stalingrad tactic rather, all I would say to that is that, you know, two weeks was a very um, pitiful Stalingrad tactic. Yeah. Well, and, and help me understand this better, Stephen, but I, I've never heard of cases where someone can say, oh, you can't arrest me because my lawyer is not around. And I was looking at Section 35 of the Constitution, which deals with arrested, detained and accused person. That doesn't talk to the presence of the lawyer when someone is detained. So when you haven't been arrested, um, your right to legal representation, representation actually does not arise. This comes in effect after the arrest. Is that not how you understand it? Well, no, look, okay. Chairman, the, the question you're asking is quite technical. It's a good question. It's a very good question. Um, arrest occurs the moment a police officer affects any form of physical control over your person. So he merely places his hand upon your shoulder. Um, you, you're then placed under arrest. Um, but the moment that he does that, he's required to warn you. Now, this doesn't arise only from the Constitution. There is even pre-constitutional law um, that you're required to be warned in terms of judges' rules. This arises from, from the common law that existed before the Constitution. Um, and and the, the, the warning in terms of judges' rules encompasses, amongst other things, the right to, uh, to be warned and told and informed of the right to remain silent, consequences of not remaining silent, and of the right to have a legal representative there. And so the moment you're placed under arrest, obviously it, it's, it's not going to be practicable that uh, a lawyer can sort of just apparate as it is. But um, but 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 you, you you must then be in a position to call your lawyer. Yeah. Now it's important just just to to preface that 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 type of arrest you know you, the police officer uh, effects physical control over the person of a, of an arrestee. That would occur in, typically in a, in a sort of um, for lack of a better term on the beat and you know when, when a police officer comes across a person in the process of committing a crime or in the process of escaping or something of that nature when a uh you know there's, there's been an investigation with a particular subject in in my, in my oh, that's the top the, the the focus of that investigation that investigation concludes um and then the the Invest the, the, the SAPS or the NPA is now a view that the matter is trial ready and can, the person can yeah. be brought to court. Different considerations come into, into being. It's not something that happens yeah. spontaneously. And my understanding is that the those considerations have been made, uh, Stephen. Uh, the, NPA, the NPA was very courteous towards the Speaker of Parliament. They indicated on the 9th of March already that this is what we intend to do. My understanding is that you were not available. The NPA said, OK, when is the lawyer going to be available? So by the 9th of March already, you and your client, the Speaker of Parliament, knew of the intention of the NPA. So why were no arrangements made? Because in that way, you know for sure that she's not going to be handcuffed. You know for sure at the time, uh, because the NPA makes a commitment that we're not going to oppose bail. So why try to interdict the arrest? Why not make an arrangement on when you can go and hand herself over so she can appear in court? Well, no, Clement, with respect, your timeline is, is slightly off. Um, contact was first made with my client. This is all borne born out in public papers. Uh, contact was made with my client uh, on the 8th of March. She was at that point out of the country. Um, and she indicated that um, and that, that, that she didn't have a lawyer on hand and she required to investigate, find a lawyer, uh, a point, consult and appoint, and that she would do this uh, on the 15th or 16th, if I remember the dates correctly, of March uh, upon her return to South Africa. And she did that. We consulted, um, again, this was borne out in public papers. 
on the uh, 17th of March for the first time, and I made contact with the, the NPA the same day. Yeah. And that, when, you, when you speak about arrangements being made, that is exactly what we attempted to do, was, was engage. And uh, I'm not going to accuse the NPA of being discourteous. That, that's not the case. But there was a lack of the type of flexibility. I indicated that the first available date that I would be available was, was the And when third. was that? The third. So the third is tomorrow. Why can't you take her to the police station? <laughs> Look, I've said before, I don't, I don't want to get dragged into specifics or preempt anything, certainly I'm not, not on live television. But uh, what, I, what I can say is what I've said before is we're in the final uh, uh, consultation and engagement with the NPA. Stephen, you've indicated to the NPA that you would be available to help the Speaker of Parliament hand herself over by the third. Tomorrow is the third. Why are you not sticking to that commitment? Clement, I'm not, I'm not not sticking to it. I'm just not going to uh, disclose my hand or, or, or do anything or say anything. It's not a hand. You, you are just, you're just confirming that you're going to do what you've promised to do. That's not a secret. It doesn't reveal your case or your client's case. It just says, I made a promise that I'm going to go with this person on the 3rd of April to hand herself over. But right now, what it sounds like to me is you seem to be going back on your word. And if you are not, what's wrong with you telling us this evening that as a commitment that I've made, I'm going to stick to it. And tomorrow we're going to take her to the police station so she can appear in court. Clement, you would realize now, just as a very general proposition, you would realize that this is not quite as simple as that. Uh, it's 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 there's a question of the type of engagements and arrangements that need to be made with the NPA. It's not just a, a, a rock up and arrive and hope for the best. We're going to do what we're going to do in consultation and engagement with the NPA. We're certainly not running away. I'm certainly not uh, going back on my word in any respect. It's about um, the type of engagement that I need to make with the NPA and their representatives so that we can make a seamless uh, 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 process, make the, seamless, the process seamless, which is what they themselves want. So it's, it's a question of um, the, the, our, our, how we uh, coordinate with the NPA at this point. It's not a question of going back on my work at all. Okay, um, I'll, 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 the viewers will decide how they, they read it, Stephen. Uh, it, it certainly appears like that to me, but we'll, we'll wait and see. I just want to ask this question about Section 35 of the Constitution, and you are the lawyer here, I am not. In my layman's understanding, it would really be tricky if every time somebody had to be arrested, the lawyer had to be present. Because someone can make an argument that, why are you coming to arrest me now? My lawyer is on holiday in Dubai and is only coming back in six weeks' time. Because that's effectively what's happened here. said, Well, I need legal representation when I hand myself over. That's why the NPA made arrangement with you as the lawyer, which is when you made the commitment for the 3rd of April. Does it make sense to you, though, that every time someone has to be arrested, they would need to have a lawyer with them? Because my understanding is once you are arrested, you are told to remain silent, you've got a right to contact your lawyer, that's what comes after the arrest has been effected. In this case, Nosevuya Mapisa Ngakula wants to be given the privileges before an actual arrest or the handing over actually happens. No, Clement, look, you ask very good and very technical questions and, and uh, I would commend you for that. But, um, to, to, to give you a full answer to that, I, I would need to keep you all night. I'm not going to do that. What I will say is that it's not a one-size-fits-all approach. I, I sort of gave you the example of a person who's stopped in the process of committing a crime and the police officer has to effect the arrest in order to prevent an escape or prevent the uh, continuation of the commission of the crime. Um, that's, that's, that's not what's happening here, obviously. Now, um, the person does have the right to legal representation um, and, and, and typically there and then. So the, person, the, the police officer affects the arrest and, then, and, and uh, the person is given an opportunity immediately to call their lawyer. Now, in this type of situation we're faced with, with here where it sort of follows an investigation and there's a, 
the ability a person's address is known, everything, okay. they're, they're not a flight risk, everything about them is known. Mm. Um, and yes, there, there should be an engagement and consultation with the lawyer. Okay. So, look, the right to the legal representative exists, it is there, you have the right to a lawyer when you're arrested. It's not an unlimited right, there's no right that's unlimited. Okay. Um, so it's a, it's a question of horses for courses and the uh, uh, reasonable accommodation and what the the circumstances of that case and those what, what exactly is happening are and 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 really what it should be is the police officers or, or, or the arresting officer whoever they might be should err on the side of caution and try as best they can yeah. without obviating or negating the, the, the purpose of the arrest okay. Let, to, to give effect to the person's right to representation and silence and everything. Else. Okay, I'm, I'm running out of time. I've got a minute left, uh, Stephen, but I just want to quickly ask. The, the legal team argued in court that the arrest of the speaker would be unlawful because there's a weak case against her. How do you know that when you haven't looked at the docket? Well, we, we, we've, we've discussed this before, I think. I mean, um, it's it's really a result of the leaks that have been published in the media um, that emanate from the MPA itself. So you know, it's, it's a very selective and one-sided, but even though it's selective and one-sided, you can see okay. the cracks in the state's case. So you're relying on speculation. Section 204. So you're relying on speculation because you haven't seen the docket. You're relying on what the media is reporting about. That is pure speculation. Well... If the media is wrong in what they've, in what they've uh, reported, uh, then, then obviously we'll find out, out about that in due course. Stephen May, thank you so much for making time for us. I really appreciate your time on Face the Nation tonight. That is Nosivu Mapisa Ngakula's lawyer, Stephen May. After the break, we're going to look at what processes are going to be unfolding if Nosivu Mapisa Ngakula hands herself over and appears in court. The Veterans League's president, Snooki Zikalala, is going to join us after the break. Welcome back to Face the Nation. We asked you earlier if you think the Speaker of the National Assembly, uh, Nosivu Mapisa Ngakula, should do the right thing and resign. And do you think she will even resign? And if there's a motion of no confidence in her in Parliament, what do you think is going to happen? In the past, the ANC has used its majority to try and close ranks and protect uh, their own comrades. Is that how it's going to unfold this time around? We've also been asking you about the NPA's capacity to have a successful prosecution in this particular case of Nosivu Mapisa Ngakula. So let's listen to some of the voice notes you've sent. Our abiding citizens should welcome the court ruling. It could have gone either way, but the judge saw that um, indeed this is just another Stalingrad tactic. Um, now the ball is very much in the ANC's court in terms of what happens to the speaker because we need to preserve the dignity of that office and surely at this point in time the, st the speaker should step aside. But we know how the ANC likes to delay things and perhaps rightly so once the law to take its course first. But sometimes the damage they do by um, keeping cadres for the longest time until a trial is over or something happens does more damage than um, acting proactively um, um, as should be the case. Good evening, Clement. My view is that the current speaker, Nosivie Mapisa Ngagula, certainly needs to resign from office um, because the responsibility of parliament is to pass laws, but it's also to oversee the work of the executive, or at least to ensure that uh, they perform their duties properly. So how can we trust that um, she can sit at the helm of that institution while she herself um, is implicated um, in allegations of corruption and bribery, that she herself uh, is likely um, a transgressor of these very laws. 
that which parliament has the responsibility of passing. And so I think uh, to ensure that there is no further damage to the integrity of uh, the institution, I think uh, the speaker certainly needs to step down. Uh, Clement, uh, good evening. And uh, thank you so much for this new show. And uh, my thoughts on the matter that happened in Pretoria is that the judge ruled fairly. It was a good judgment. I have a question, though. Why did not his legal representative advise her that there was no prospect of success, of, of success in this matter instead of just going ahead and making her lose she, it was obvious she was going to lose the second part is why is she not resigning uh, maybe stepping aside because this is the right thing to do we are in a culture where anc in the face of overwhelming evidence they will not step down she should step down because it's an honorable thing to do Kustas. well it is an honorable thing to do but is that an honorable thing that ANC comrades often do. Now, the National uh, African National Congress's Veterans League has held a tough stance on corruption with the president of the league, Snooki Zikalala, calling for those implicated in state capture corruption not to stand as public officials. The league's deputy president, Mavusom Simang, went as far as temporarily quitting the party. And among his grievances was the party's inability to effectively deal with corrupt individuals. So what is the league's position on alleged corruption by high-ranking officials in the party. How does this even affect the party's renewal agenda? Snooki Zikalala is in studio with us. Welcome to Face the Nation, Mr. Zikalala. Good evening. Good evening, Clement, and um, um, uh, happy to, to, to host me in the new show. Thank you and very much. I highly appreciate it. Uh, you've heard what Nosivu Yamapisa Ngakula's lawyer had to say. Any thoughts, any reaction to what you heard? Well, it's unfortunate that the lawyer says that um, uh, he's not going to uh, assist her to hand herself over to, to the police, it's unfortunate. And so as Veterans League would have expected her to do the right thing, to hand herself over. And of course, the NPA made it very clear that um, she hands herself over and then she, 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 there's a docket opened and she's given a bail and she goes home. Mm. Simple as that. Mm. But it's unfortunate that um, um, Comrade Nosivu Amapisa decided not to do that. Yeah. And so as veterans, we've been trying our level best to, to contact her through the husband for the last two days. We are not able to do so. I wouldn't say for what, because as, we, as you know, that our stance is very firm. All those who are implicated in state capture or in any corruption must step down, especially if they are charged, if mm -hmm. they are criminally charged, must step down and we must not participate in any activities of the African National Congress. Because as you know, the ANC has suffered severely because of individuals who are involved in malfeasance. And in the past, ANC was, was uh, defending those people. We saw exactly we defended Zuma. And let's look what he has done. He, called, he caused counter-revolution in this country in 2008 when they removed um, Tabombeki. But we, we kept on defending him. You cannot defend people who are doing wrong things. This is what we're saying. And so unfortunately, I cannot reveal what discussions we, we're going to hold, have with the husband. But uh, we have not res received any response from him. Mm -hmm. I've sent him a text message this afternoon. We'll still try. But unfortunately, it's a confidential discussion that we're going to have with the husband because, you know, going through her, she's going through emotions. Yeah. It's a very difficult time for her. And so uh, that, this is your fellow way, comrade, Nosivu Yama Pisa Ngakula, that is, uh, yeah. together with the husband. What would, you be, what would be your advice to her right now? It's a, it's a, it's a tough question. It wasn't my, my advice. Um, I know she must just do the right thing because the integrity of parliament and her own integrity is very, very important. My own advice, I can't say my personal advice because I must represent the organization. That is why we want to speak to the husband uh, so that she must do the right thing. I won't say what is that right thing because it's important for her to preserve the dignity of parliament. And she's only left the two months. Parliament is going on recess or is rising in two months time and uh, she won't lose anything. And so what we are saying that uh, it's up to her to consider what needs to be done. And so, and because she said she's not standing uh, for, for, for elections uh, for, to be on the list, she's not on the list. Yeah. And uh, in as far as we're concerned, she must do what is right for, for the organization because she's not the, bigger than the organization. The organization is bigger than her.
Why hasn't she appeared before the party's integrity commission? Because that's what they expected her to do um, a couple of weeks ago when the rumors were already starting uh, that she would be handing herself over and, and appearing in court. Well, what we, what we had, <coughs> of course, from the integrity commission, she was supposed to have appeared last week Wednesday. Mm. I've not communicated with members of the integrity commission to find out whether has she appeared or not. And we have not had an NWC meeting where we'll be um, briefed whether she appeared or not, where we, where we receive we receive uh, reports from the integrity, integrity Commission. And so I don't know whether she has appeared or not because we did speak to the Integrity Commission and requested that they must call her yeah. to appear in front of them. And we are sure that a message has been sent to her. I'm not sure whether she appeared on, on Wednesday or not. But to be clear, when you look at the step aside resolution, once you are formally charged yeah. in court, the step aside resolution it, kicks it, in. It, it kicks in immediately. So the minute she appears in court, yeah. she's got to step aside. Yeah. That's what the party expects. That, that's a party expect. That's a resolution of the 55th conference, and that resolution is supposed to be put to be included in the amendment of the constitution, which we are not able to amend the constitution in January because we could not uh, reach a quorum. Mm -hmm. But immediately, if she's she gets criminally charged, she steps, uh, she steps down immediately. Yeah. And of course, the internal process of the ANC also kick in. This matter may find itself in, in Parliament, Mr. Zikalala, because the DA is now calling for an immediate debate in that motion of no confidence um, in the Speaker, and they're saying there must be a vote on it before the Parliament, uh, the term of Parliament finishes. What should be the approach of the ANC? In the past, as the ANC, you've used your majority to protect the former president, Jacob Zuma. You've used it to protect um, the, the current president, Cyril Ramaphosa. As the Veterans League, what do you expect to be the approach of ANC MPs when that motion of no confidence is being debated and voted on? Well, as you know, we work as a collective. And so I don't know what's the approach of the SG and um, the, um, the, um, the, um, the chief whip. And so I tried to call the chief whip before I came in to find out what's the attitude of uh, majority in parliament. But as the Veterans League, as people who have been talking tough on corruption, as people who have been saying leaders have to be held accountable, what do you expect MPs to that do? That is why we would expect, we expect it, uh, that she must appear in court tomorrow so that it saves us from uh, taking action against her in terms of uh, voting with the, with the DA and other opposition parties. We'd expect it to go to court tomorrow so that she gets charged and she steps down immediately. That will save the African National Congress because what's important is the image and the integrity of the ANC and the Im image and integrity of, of Parliament. Let's talk about the image of the African National Congress. Has the ANC been serious about dealing with corruption and ensuring that comrades and leaders of the ANC that are accused of serious crimes or are facing charges that are serious are actually held accountable and they're not continuously being deployed into powerful positions? Well, as you know, that uh, the 55th conference of the ANC made it very clear that um, we are renewing the organization. Mm -hmm. And you cannot renew the organization once we have people who have, who have criminal charges against them. And so immediately, if, as we are saying, immediately if we are found wanting, we are criminally charged, we have to step down and we'll make sure as veterans that happens. That is why in the list um, that we have currently, there are only two, three, four people who have not yet been charged. Mm -hmm. And so they cannot be taken off the list. But the Secretary General of the African National Congress assured us that they will be charged. Immediately, if they are charged by the National oh, District... The Secretary General of the ANC of the assured ANC. you they will be charged by what, the NPA? No, 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 by oh. the ANC. Okay, by the ANC. But because they have to go through the process okay. of the ANC's internal processes of the ANC. I was worried a little bit there. Uh, and the internal processes the of the ANC. <laughs> okay. Because the ANC made it clear, for instance, in April last year, the ANC, NEC of the ANC took a resolution okay. that those who are implicated in state capture must go to the Integrity Commission. And those who have failed to do so must go to the National Disciplinary Committee. And so there are four comrades who have not gone to the Integrity Commission. And so they are, they are, they are supposed to appear now in front of the National Disciplinary Committee, which will happen. And they're once they appear... The they're still on the national list. They're still on the national list for now. the problem I have for now. with that, Mr. For now. Because they have not been charged. They have not been charged. Yes. But, but when you talk about leadership... You can look at the legal principle, which is what you're using as the ANC. You're using yeah. the legal principle in that people are not criminally charged in the justice system. Therefore, we're not going to go after them. Yeah. But there's also the ethical principle. If you are a party that believes in accountability, in ethical leadership, you don't need to wait for yeah, the president of the ANC to be officially charged. If there are serious allegations, 
that are bringing disrepute to the organization, what's wrong with saying, just step aside, deal with that for that moment. When you've cleared your name, you can come back because you continuously staying here, that affects the organization. Yeah, we're a, we a human rights organization. We believe in the rule of law. And so we are processes that have to be undertaken within the ANC. You cannot say because of rumors, this individual must step aside. That is why the National Disciplinary Committee of the ANC must charge the individual. Once that individual has been charged, mm. he then steps step aside immediately. Except it's not rumors, it's the State Capture Commission. No, if they, no it's, well, the State Capture said, the State Capture said, those who appeared in front of them, they are going to criminally charge them. But the state capture has not done that. The National Prosecution Authority has not done that. So you don't think it's enough that a commission of inquiry has found that someone who is a cabinet minister is found wanting, this is what they've been able to do. You've looked at the evidence. You don't think that's enough for you to talk to the person, to step aside? You still want to look at the legal principle and no, put no, the ethical see, for, principle for instance, aside? It's, it's, uh, some senior people have approached these comrades and say, can you, for, this, for the sake of the organization, can you step down? Yeah because you have yeah, yeah, been fingered by, the, by state capture. He said, he said if, you, if I step down, if you remove me now, I'll take you to court. Because legally, within the ANC, I've not been charged by the National Disciplinary Committee of the ANC. The, the state itself has not uh, put criminal charges against me, mm -hmm. and so I cannot. Yeah. And so that is why we are speaking to the SG, the SG has promised that he must fast track the process of charging these comrades for failing to go to the integrity commission so that they can be taken to a DC, National Disciplinary Committee. Immediately, if they appear in the National Disciplinary Committee, they'll be removed from the list. So I, I want to understand how serious the ANC is about the renewal project. And I want to use the example of, of President Cyril Ramaphosa yeah. and some of the people that he's appointed in his cabinet. I want to take David Mashlobo as an example for now. He's the deputy minister um, of water and sanitation. Of water and sanitation. Now, President Cyril Ramaphosa once appointed a high-level review panel. Mm -hmm. It was led by Dr. Sidney Mufamadi, mm -hmm. if I'm not mistaken, to look into the affairs of the state security agency. Because during the time when former President Jacob Zuma um, was the head of state, there were concerns that that agency was politicized. Mm. The high-level review panel came back and said, David Mashobo, um, Arthur Frazier, are people that we think and we see that have actually been involved in politicizing that agency. There are many other allegations that the high-level review panel had against the two. You would expect that the president looks at that report and says, I don't want these people anywhere close to my cabinet. But that's not what he did. He appointed David Mashobo as his deputy. He appointed Arthur Frazier as the commissioner of correctional services. Does that demonstrate to you a president who is serious about accountability and renewal? Well, we don't appoint uh, ministers. They serve at the behest of the president. And of course, uh, the, that is why we are saying that uh, David Machabo himself, um, I'm sorry that I'm using him as an example. He has not appeared in front of the integrity commission. Now he has to face the National Disciplinary Committee. Once that happened, of course, action will be taken against him and also in the issue of Arthur Fraser where we, we he has not appeared I'm not sure about Arthur Fraser because we have not seen the, the integrity commission's report whether he had appeared or not but immediately if the NPA the most unfortunate thing and frustrating is NPA is very slow on prosecuting these individuals because NPA has been so there are people at the highest level who need to be prosecuted but NPA is dragging its feet if the NPA was very serious in ensuring that individuals who are implicated in the Zondo Commission who have serious uh, allegations that against them and they've been processed properly NPA must serve charges against them that will help the ANC the ANC cannot charge you if uh, NPA has not charged you but internal processes have already, have already started that the integrity commission immediately if uh, if the Integrity Commission finds you wanting and has adverse findings against you, you must face the DC immediately. The problem is even there, th and the, the reason I talk about the legal process and the ethical process as a leader, what the ethical expectations are, is because I understand that sometimes these pr internal processes of the ANC can be factionalized. Um, I mean, I remember before the Nazareth conference, uh, the recent Nazareth conference, we didn't have the report from the Integrity Commission on Palapala. Mm -hmm. And everybody was asking themselves, how is it that the Integrity Commission works on the Palapala report and they're not able to give you as the NEC, well, the NEC members, a report on what they have found? 
It was over a year later. How? The Integrity Commission never really takes that long. Once you've appeared before them, they deliberate and they come and tell you what the outcome is. But on Palapala, Pala, they took over a year. Yeah, but we understand we have not seen the Integrity Commission's report currently. There is a report on Palapala Pala which will receive at the next NEC. Yeah, I think it will be made. Does it make sense to you, Mr. Sigalala, yeah. that a, a report on Palapala Pala is coming to you how many years now? Three years it's or so? Almost three years. That doesn't make sense. No, 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 have you ever seen that in the Integrity Commission I, I, I where they take three years? Report. I, haven't I haven't seen, seen that. It. We haven't seen it. As members of the NEC, we have not seen it. But you but see what I mean about the factionalization of internal processes, that when there are certain people who are powerful, who are favored, who've got the support of the majority of the leaders of the ANC, things seem to be done differently to how they are normally done. No, no, I think, uh, I think uh, let's wait for the report of the Integrity Commission on Palapala. Pala. Uh, I think the SG will come and talk about it immediately when it's released. Secondly, is that in the NDC, National Disciplinary Committee of the ANC, it's not factionalized at all. Six members of the NDC are members of the ANC Veterans League. They've got no interest in what's happening within the African National Congress. And so it, it cannot be factionalized. And four of them are NEC members. The same thing, same, same thing happens in the National Dis Disciplinary Committee of Appeals. Six members of the National Committee, Dis uh, uh, Disciplinary Committee of Appeals are members of the Veterans League who are not we are not uh, embroiled in what's happening within the NEC, so that they are impartial when a case is presented to them, they can be able to take a decision that will, that will save the face and the integrity of the, of the organization. In the NDC and National Disciplinary Committee of Appeals, it's not factionalized. I want to make it very clear. It's not at all. What do you say to South Africans that are watching us this evening and still have doubts about the African National Congress and their well, commitment uh, to that renewal agenda? Because you've been talking about it for a very long time. Yeah. We're ready to renew. Um, this is a new path. We're taking accountability. Corruption is no longer going to be tolerated. People watching us now and thinking, I'm not so sure. What do you say to them? No, no, I, I say to them, they should look at the list currently of comrades going to, to parliament. Only the, the Zizi four, Koto is on that list. No, no, the, I think it will be dealt with before, <laughs> before, before we, we go for elections. I'm saying that a number of people who were, were in, implicated and were facing uh, charges, some of them with VBS, have been removed. We're very strict in terms of selecting those who are nominated, but very strict. The criteria that we set by Comrade Khalema and also by the NEC, it was very, very strict. They have done vetting, they've gone to, to look through criminal records of those who, who had criminal uh, charges. They've removed them from the list. And so we have done exceptionally well, except those that I'm speaking about, the only six, but I'm saying it's going to happen before we go to to, to, to elections on, on the 29th of May. But the society must give us another chance. Another chance. To, another chance. Well, uh, this because is I'm what? confident the, that the we are on the, on the renewal path. Is we it are the on the sixth? Renewal is path. it the fourth chance? Because this is not the second chance. No, no. I'm, I'm saying we are, we are on the path of renewal. Society must, must believe in us. We as veterans, we are not going to stop. We can be hated within the ANC, within the, the, um, those who are found wanting. We don't care. We'll definitely make sure that we root out those individuals who are found wanting or corrupt within the ANC, but we'll follow procedure. That's what is important because we're a human rights country and we believe in the rule of law in the country itself. And if someone is watching and saying, I hear you, Mr. Zikalala, and I appreciate the work you're doing as the Veterans League in holding the NEC leaders accountable and making sure that they do what is right, but I've given the ANC a chance before, not once, not twice. Not yeah, but I, I, think, I think currently the ball is rolling mm -hmm. and very, very fast. And um, as veterans, we're united. And even the ANC has made it very clear, very, very clear, that individuals are found wanting them to step down immediately. The SG also made, made a, a pronouncement mm -hmm. when he was, uh, I think he was in the Eastern Cape, that saying that immediately if Comrade Nosivuya Mapisa uh, is being charged, she'll step down. He has committed himself to that. And so we believe in that because we work with the SG. I mean, we make sure that the SG does the right things and he respects us and we respect him as well. Snooki Zikalala, uh, the ANC Veterans League President, I appreciate your time. Thank this you very much. Evening on Face the Nation. We've received some of your tweets responding to some of the conversations we've heard on the show this evening, but also the question we asked you earlier about the Speaker of Parliament and the capacity of the NPA. Let's look at some of those tweets that are coming through now. We've got a tweet now from Kyle who says, why is the lawyer for the speaker so hesitant to answer the questions though? Hashtag uh, face the nation. That's a message there from Kyle. Proudly South African, 
Duke says she was just hasty. Uh, Justice Sulet Potterell says if the court was to grant the Speaker of Parliament Nasivia Mapisa Ngakula's application, then the floodgates will open and all suspects will make such an appointment to prevent their arrest. And Kustas on Twitter says, at Face the Nation, the Speaker of Parliament should have resigned already. The ANC has this culture of doubling down in the face of corruption scandals. It's a shame. Why are they quiet? Do they think this will disappear? Thank you so much for your tweets. We appreciate the voice notes that you sent as well earlier on. This is where we come to the end of our inaugural Face the Nation show. We'll be back again on Thursday at 8 p.m. Thanks for watching. Have a good evening. Cheers.